Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jacksonville History Show. I'm Harry Reagan. Tonight, an oral history recording with one of Jacksonville's broadcasting pioneers. Bob Schellenberg was sales manager and general manager at WJXT TV4. Here's our interview with Bob Schellenberg. You came to uh, Channel 4 uh, in the 60s? Mm-hmm. Okay. 62. Mm-hmm. Uh, I came down here from Washington with my family. Uh, it's a side story for that. Uh, my mother-in-law had told my wife that I would never like it, so don't worry about it. You're moving to Jacksonville because he's going to come back after that visit and tell you he hates it. <laughs> the reverse was true. I came down, loved it, said it was going to be a great place to raise children, uh, and obviously convinced my wife that was the case. And so my mother and I, and I didn't speak for a couple of weeks, but uh, we got along pretty well. But it was... Uh, and it turned out to be uh, a good decision. <coughs> I mean, you've uh, enjoyed living in Jacksonville all this I, year. I clearly did. And for the reason I came down here, you know, for the job, of course, but for raising children, it was, uh, it was nothing better. Uh, the children were able to ride bikes to school, and uh, it was just an all-around good experience for us. Mm -hmm. And of course, with our volume of children, it was important to make sure that they were safe and sound. And you were here at a very important uh, period when Channel 4 was really uh, taking off. It was, uh, it was, it had begun to do that uh, uh, until we reached a point of dominance in this marketplace that really is unknown today. Uh, I mean, it could never happen today, I don't think. Now, this uh, is a need we remind people before cable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it was yeah. Uh, when this was a four station market. Yeah. Uh, it was a three-station market for a while, and finally we had a fourth station. But uh, when a fourth station came on, and we were still on our local, <coughs> excuse me, our local news, uh, had a 60% share. Uh, I mean, to look at that in today's numbers, are it would be totally unrealistic. What would today's numbers be? Just to well, somewhere in the 20s, if you if you got, uh, I mean, if you were in a powerhouse. Uh -huh. But uh, we used to, I used to think it was a great thing for CBS to know, but uh, some people in Washington said, don't, uh, don't make a big deal out of that. And I couldn't understand why, frankly, because uh, we delivered more to Walla Cronkite than anybody else in the country with a share of audience, not mm -hmm. total audience, of course. But uh, that led to our familiarity with <coughs> Walter Cronkite. And Walter came down, as you remember, mm -hmm. on the birthday of Bill Grove and his anniversary. We had a big party, and Walter doesn't do those things, by the way, or didn't do those no. things. And uh, we persuaded him, uh, and CBS was very helpful in persuading him to come down and be our keynote speaker. And it was a huge success. Uh, and Walter, at that point, was without question. <coughs> There was an NBC pair that was very popular, but Walter still dominated the marketplace. That, that pair being Huntley and Brinkley. Huntley and Brinkley, right. correct. Right. And then there was ABC, which was not even on the radar screen, basically. No, not that at that point, point no. Yeah. So, um, now, <laughs> part of Channel 4's uh, dominance may be attributed, I suppose, to the fact that they had a 10-year head start. They were on the air about 10 years oh, before sure. anybody else. Sure. Uh, but I wouldn't mentioned that that's the only factor. No, it I. They were doing some other things right. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, we implemented the uh, CBS programming with other programming. And of course, the one thing that I guess the keynote of this whole station, I guess people here that have come in, in later years really don't understand the dominance of our news department and our investigative report and our editorial policy. Mm -hmm. Those three things combined. Uh, gave people the opportunity of getting the news that they knew was accurate and timely, editorials that gave them a position, strong position, as you know, mm -hmm. on issues we thought they should be discussing that had a, f a debate in the marketplace that made a difference in their futures. And then the investigative reports, which were very important. Now, another factor here. <coughs> This is uh, 
an oral history interview, so we have to be uh, as accurate as we can be. And uh, there was a kind of journalism vacuum created by a, shall we say, less than excellent newspaper. Uh, actually, two newspapers. There was an afternoon yes. paper. Uh -huh. But the railroad-owned newspapers were not willing to do much journalistic um, in terms of investigative reporting and so forth. Well, I think that clearly was a problem, and uh, our competition uh, at that point uh, in, in television were not interested in doing editorials nor investigative reporters, so that marketplace was totally ours. We owned that marketplace. Mm -hmm. And with the newspaper as weak as it was, in a sense weak, uh, it had good circulation, but it was not a news news paper. Mm -hmm. It was a good comic page. It had good sports, but uh, from the standpoint of being uh, editorially prominent, it wasn't. And uh, Channel 4 uh, is uh, credited, uh, we're not just beating our own drum here. Uh, sure we are. <laughs> Ch Channel 4 is credited with uh, bringing about a, one of the most important things that ever happened in Jacksonville, the consolidated government. Uh, with Norm Davis and Bill Grove? Um, no question. Well, I'm not, you, you point that out, and that's clearly a... Uh, when you're instrumental in changing the government form, you've made an enormous step forward in the progress of the people of Jacksonville. Now, I want to ask you, uh, <coughs> you came out of sales. Exactly. And uh, there, there would have been some apprehension, I think, at the point where you became general manager. Clearly. And. Uh, and yet, uh, my perception was always that there was a firewall between sales and news, and there was never any attempt, even, to influence news judgment from the sales department. Well, it's funny that you say that, because shortly before I became general manager, there was an article published in either Time or Newsweek, and the source was uh, an Atlanta source, which pointed out that exactly the opposite of what you just said had happened. That uh, a leading citizen of Jacksonville had talked to the sales department and threatened them with reduction of their advertising budget if they hadn't killed a story. The sales person involved, according to the story, went down to the news department and pleaded with them to kill the story. Well, that never happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't have let it happen, but uh, all the all the threats that I said that if any of any one of the salesmen did that, he was out. He was out the door. I mean, their job was to market advertising, not news. But I would assume that uh, some of the people in your sales department might have been unhappy from time to time with what Very was being unhappy. done by the news department. Very unhappy because there were a lot of <sighs> okay the uh, the prime targets of some of the investigative reports. Mm -hmm were some of the largest advertisers we had on the station. Uh, so threatening to uh, cancel advertising? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But there was no place to go. <laughs> uh, clearly, now that sounds uh, egotistical, but the point is that we were so dominant in the marketplace, they could threaten all they wanted to. So that gave you a tremendous uh, advantage? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, it's a boost to know that, and, they, and some of them did reduce their, their schedules. Mm -hmm. I, I remember one Clearly, we made a, a decision on how advertising was to be sold. And uh, our biggest advertiser <coughs> said, I won't do it. Well, if we had gone along with them, our whole advertising concept would have destroyed. So we said, no, I'm sorry. That's not the way it's going to be. It took them about a month to come back. And you managed to shift your uh, outlook realizing that you had this job as general manager that was going to be different as Clearly. compared to sales manager. Sure. Sure. It's, uh, <clears throat> you have to, the only thing that, the only difference, uh, or the difference is that you're selling something. Mm -hmm. you're, you're selling a station as a whole, or you're selling an individual or as an advertising slogan. Uh, so I looked on the general manager's job as trying to organize all of the people in all of the departments to be as enthusiastic about the station as the salespeople had to be. And news was, and I suppose still is, a major sales tool. No question. Uh, that you were selling the fact that this was a dominant news department that uh, w was doing stuff that 
people could not afford to miss. They had to tune in at 6 o'clock to see what was going on. We were the water, water cooler conversation the day after. Mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't watch editorials or you didn't watch our news, the conversation in offices around the city would have come to a, a dreadful halt. Because we were the, the thing that motivated people to discuss issues and to make decisions. So let's go back to uh, hell, as you said, uh, <laughs> the, the, the period of the license challenges. It, it was protracted. It went on and on and on. Two years. And, uh, <clears throat> and you lived with this shadow over your operation. Uh, and, and I guess you tried to do what you always did without any regard to this threat of the, on the license. Well, you were there, and you may have remembered. I, I used to talk to the news people and say, look, we're not going to change your operation. These people are wrong. We're right. So I don't want the influence of the outside. And they were facing with it every day, of course, as, as all of us were. Uh, don't change your operation. We're not going to change your editorial policy, nor did we. Mm -hmm. We were still as vigorous and as uh, thought-provoking in our editorials as we had been before. And our, our news department really did not decline in its uh, aggressiveness. So during that period, we didn't bend to the, the will or the conscience of this group of people, feeling that we had the, the major portion of people, maybe not the select few of, in relative terms, of licensed challenges. And there were times when uh, you must have been saying, when is this nightmare going Please to go away. Oh, it was, if Actually, I've, I've thought about that. If it hadn't been for my wife and my family, I don't know that I could have held together. Mm -hmm. Because going home at night, I'd get home at maybe 7, 7.15 or so, uh, <coughs> uh, and see some of the children. And my wife, who was faced with the same problems I was on a daily basis, mm -hmm. Of course, the social s circle that she was running in had the same wives of the people who were challenging. And they always said the same thing, which was interesting. They'd come to me at a uh, reception and say, Bob, this isn't against you. Yeah. This is against the Washington Post. All right. They really thought that we were puppets. Mm -hmm. They really thought there were strings from Washington to Jacksonville, and they were yanking strings, and we were responding. That couldn't have been further from the truth. I never, in the time that I was here, ever had anyone call me about anything in the editorial or news department. And do you think that's, uh, there's a lot of TV stations around the country uh, that are owned by big corporations, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and people complain about no local ownership and so forth. Sure. Uh, is there that same degree of autonomy, or is, is the Washington Post somewhat uh, unique in that respect? I always suspect, <coughs> excuse me, I always suspect that we were unique in that case. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So they, uh, the Washington Post management, uh, going back to Catherine Graham and, and others, uh, they were trying to make money, of course, like any corporation. They just saw this as good, a, a good way to operate TV stations, leaving a maximum amount of control at the local level. Yeah, and uh, as I say, that the, uh, the things we did, and there were, there were a lot of things that uh, clearly was, were in opposition to editorial stands that the Washington Post had taken, mm -hmm. which is, but no one from the Washington Post ever said, this is the line the Post is taking, you know, jump in the, the train. Uh, we were basically unaware of what positions they were taking. We independently took our position, and if it was in conflict, it was in conflict. Uh, it would be interesting to pause for a moment and talk about that. <laughs> Uh, the, the process of evolving editorial policy is uh, interesting. People find it very hard to believe that there was an actual kind of democratic editorial board that made decisions on what the station's editorial policy would be. And the boss, which would be you in a lot of cases, didn't always prevail. The, uh, I can remember one distinctively. Uh, there were really two. You and I fervently disagreed on. And we argued over, I bet, three sessions. We had a session, for those who don't know, we had a session each week. Mm -hmm. uh, you would bring subject matter to the, the editorial board. Uh, we would prepare 
conversations about what we thought the issue was. Uh, and that two issues would come up regularly for three weeks. And as much as I try to convince you that you were wrong, uh, the editorial board uh, voted me out. Well, the fact is, a lot of people who believe the same way as I did thought, as many people did, that I controlled the editorial yeah. board. And they come up what and say, What do you mean? You're the boss. How, how, could, you not, <laughs> how could you let this happen? Uh, and I try to explain to them what editorials are all about. Yeah. Uh, and that and takes how a the system, somewhat unique, I think, that's right. operated. That's right. And I, I know you remember the two issues we had. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I should write them down and see uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what are they? <laughs> yeah, they were. Uh, are you going to ask me what no, they no, were? I'm going to ask you to name them. <laughs> well, one was gun control, and okay. the other one was uh, Roe versus Wade, ah. which okay. was one of our biggies. Yep, yep. Well, it, it, uh, a lot of uh, interesting sessions with that editorial board. Well, they were all outspoken. Yeah. That, I mean, to have an editorial, editorial board uh, that we had that was outspoken, opinionated, so that what we finally resolved was a, an issue that had been clearly discussed mm -hmm. and finally a resolution that we all were comfortable with. Yeah. And we usually got 100% agreement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, <laughs> the policy was, and, and still is to some extent, I guess, um, we, we encouraged people to come on and take us on in uh, a reply to an editorial, which was always fun. Yeah, well, that was your job, uh, <laughs> uh, edit editing those people. Uh. Well, I, I, there may be other things that we want to talk about uh, in your uh, TV4 part of your career. But let's, uh, in, in 1983, if my notes, which came from you, <laughs> are correct, uh, you left Channel 4 and then embarked on some new careers. So, uh, <laughs> new careers is correct. Yeah. Uh, I retired politics most of, of all things. Well, as you know, uh, well, you as well as uh, I was always interested in the political system. Mm -hmm. uh, and we editorialized about it a lot, about uh, what was wrong and what was right. And uh, shortly after I <coughs> left Channel 4, a group was formed, and our purpose really was clear. We wanted to change the complexion of the city council. We thought the city council were politicians and not uh, truly representative of the community of Jacksonville. We wanted people who had experience, who, had, who could articulate issues, and thoughtfully make a decision. And we decided that many of the people on the council were not that character uh, kind. So we used to, we met every week at the then Sheridan Hotel. And I guess it was six of us. We divided this community up into uh, sections. And each one of us had responsibility in the section to find somebody that we could recommend to run. Well, we worked and worked and worked. We finally came up with two people that we were convinced would go. And both of them backed out because of the uh, uh, public notice that they had to pick up. And they said, my finances are my own. Oh, the financial disclosure. Fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm not going to do that. And of yeah. course, as you know, financial disclosure isn't any big thing anyway. But the point is, we had come to an absolute brick wall. Mm -hmm. uh, and we looked around the room, and they said, does any of you want to run? Well, I had just retired, and it kind of focused on me and saying, why don't you run? And I said, I had no interest in becoming a, a career politician. And they said, no, don't be a career politician. Go in there for a while. I mm -hmm. said, all right, I'll do it. So I did, and uh, fortunately for me, the public responded. And I was elected, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it was it was a good experience. So you kept that uh, commitment basically to serve one term, exactly, and uh, then kind of back into journalism. <laughs> that was funny because a, a search firm came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in becoming a publisher of a business newspaper. That was fascinating to me. Actually, uh, 
I wasn't familiar, uh, greatly familiar with the magazine, the, the, the newspaper in the first mm -hmm. place, so I made myself familiar with the, the newspaper. I said, yes, I think I'd at least like to talk to you about it. So I went out to Kansas City and talked to the people out there, and they had a, a great vision about what this was going to do. I said, all right, I'll give it a try. Well, what they didn't tell me is they clearly were trying to fire one of the lead people in the organization, and they didn't have the wherewithal to do it themselves. So I became the axe man mm -hmm. to uh, axe this person uh, after I had developed a series of paperwork on him, and it became a, a, a jungle. Uh, we had to change locks and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, a, a great news director uh, who came in, who was on the staff. And so we proceeded for about two years. And at that point, I said, look, I'll bring you out of the red. And it was bleeding pretty badly. Uh, and then, then I've got to go, because it was like eight to eight a day. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's. I figured at retirement I deserved a little better than that. Yeah. yeah. So I decided that uh, convinced myself and convinced them they were going to be a black th for a while and bid them farewell. Uh, <laughs> but before actual retirement, there was another uh, job you did for a while. Uh, with the Baptist Hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Mason, who I'd known, asked me if I would come over there to help him with some issues that they had. One was the access to the hospital. Uh, as you know, the railroad interferes with people going into the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, highway system was beginning to build uh, the entrance to the new bridge. And so there were issues like that. Uh, and then later on, there was an issue of the crosswalk. Uh, we finally, I came up with an, an idea, uh, two ideas of the uh, the access to the hospital. One was a tunnel. Mm -hmm. The tunnel became uh, not very solvable because underneath that is all water. Right. It became uh, an undoable project. Mm -hmm. A bridge was not viable. But there was a piece of land that was then dedicated to Prudential uh, parking lot that Baptist had willed to Prudential. Then I said, ask them to give it back to you. And then we'll use that, giving you access out. Prudential wouldn't move. Uh, they said, that's, you know, we need that piece. And it wasn't that large a piece of property. I finally got to the highway system and got them to put a ramp down uh, to a block away from the uh, parking lot. Uh, then Bill came up and said, I want to build a walkway between the Children's Hospital and, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Wolfson. And at that point, the, the bridge had not been built. And I said, that's kind of way out. I said, I don't know how you do that. So I went to the highway department, and they said, you know, once we build a bridge, we have to have certain clearances. And I said, can you judge the clearances now? And he said, no, we can't. I said, well, give me the, the highest bridge number you can come up with. So they did. So I went back to Bill, and I said, what you have to do is to build this thing so many feet above the highway, mm -hmm. and I think you can get it done. When we met on the roof of the Wolfson Hospital one day and looked down at where the, the, and the Department of Transportation people and Bill and others from the hospital were looking at this vision that he had, and he really wanted to sell the walkway to Disney as a uh, entrance to Disney with a sign up in front, uh, welcome to Florida, and, Welcome to Disneyland, that sort of thing. Well, that didn't work out. But uh, he put that up before, literally before the, the bridge was complete. And uh, so it worked out pretty well. But that all, it all helped. And it, again, another retirement. Yeah, yeah. And this one was uh, for good, right? Well, I've, I've retired more than most people do. Yeah. That was an interview with Bob Schellenberg, one of Jacksonville's broadcasting pioneers. He was sales manager and general manager at WJXT-TV4 for many years. 
You can see other interviews in this series of oral histories on the Jacksonville Historical Society's website, www.jackshistory.com. That's our show for tonight. So long, everyone.